talk about Ghana Month here at Multimedia. We're celebrating March as Ghana Month. Well, it happens to be the month in which Ghana's parliament marks 25 years of uninterrupted parliamentary democracy. There's been a lineup of activities to mark this remarkable feat. But the multi-million dollar question is, what is there to show since parliament was inaugurated in 1993? Jojo Kovner has a report. We'll see how uh, in parliament today, the minority has been agitating over what they're calling gagging, especially by the speaker. Here's that report. When we finish with that report, I'm going to be engaging one man who has been in parliament since its inception, Alban Bagwin. And of course, we'll also speak to the African Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Watch this. In parliament, where the governing party has an overwhelming majority, the minority hardly wins a debate. All it does is to have it say, but it appears the minority and the speaker, Michael Quay, is not having enough of that. At least that's what they have articulated publicly, a situation which has resulted in a frosty relationship between the minority and the speaker. The so-called disagreements between the speaker and the minority may have started in July 2017. It is important that the speaker respect the front bench of the minority. <laughs> You have to give us space to be able to put our our our, 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 our views. You, have to you cannot step up the space for the minority leadership. We have been yesterday, the day before yesterday, there were questions that were supposed to be asked yesterday in this house. They were not on the other paper. You didn't give us the opportunity to raise them. Yesterday we advertised. There were questions to be asked today again. They have not been put on the other paper. You are not giving us the opportunity to even air our views. Why? Alhaji Muntaka is not the only one who is upset with the speaker. His boss, the majority leader, Harun Idrisu himself, has had cause to complain about the conduct of Professor Michael Quay. The speaker, when, when, when I rose, you know the essence of parliamentary question is significant and integral to the exercise of oversight. Your refusal to allow me, even as minority leader, to proceed can only be an effort to stifle oversight. <laughs> In fact, on February 15, 2018, Harun Idrisu almost sounded disrespectful to the third most powerful man in the country. I stood up before the majority leader. You owe me that courtesy and that respect. You owe me that courtesy and that respect. Mr. Speaker, you cannot, even after hearing him, you were still not decided whether to hear me or not. All I'm voted to do here is to speak, and as minority leader, to speak to the rules. May I respectfully, I'm not here to talk about quorum. May I draw your attention to order 130, and why I was on my feet, and I'm within the rules. And order 130 reads, if order any order member... Order 130. One. 130. <laughs> 130. Rules. Mr. Speaker, you owe me. I don't want to ever disrespect you. But if you invite me, I will. If you invite me, I will. Yes, I will. Yes, no. These developments have caused the minority to raise questions about the impartiality of the speaker. So is Speaker Michael Quay being too high-handed with a minority, or we simply have a recalcitrant minority in Parliament? So that's just a sum of what has been happening in Parliament quite recently. Like I indicated, fortunately for us, uh, if we want to know whether or not Parliament has come any far, there's one man who has been there since the inception of Parliament and still remains. He's Member of Parliament for Nadoli Kalu, Alban Bagwin. He joins me live from Parliament. Sir, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Executive Director of the African Center for Parliamentary Affairs, Dr. Rashid Rahman, is also here in the studio. Dr. Rahman, thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank you. Okay. I believe that the uh, um, Honorable uh, Alban Bagwin can hear me now. Sir, if you can hear me, thank you very much for your time on this show, and you're welcome.
Okay, we're going to have to deal with a bit of delays here. Technology does its own thing, doesn't it? But uh, let's start with Dr. Rashid Draman, who's here in the studio with me. Dr. Draman, two, over, over two decades mm. of uninterrupted parliamentary democracy. Now, when you're talking in general about Ghana's democracy, sometimes people argue that, well, there was this coup and it interrupted the process. But for parliaments, they can say that it has not been interrupted. What is there to show? Um, thank you very much. I think what is there to show is, uh, is the stability that we have enjoyed um, over the last 25 years. And uh, Parliament has been that symbol, the symbol of that stability, that you have uh, a deliberative, deliberative assembly where the representatives of you and I would go and sit down. Most of the time they, ag they agree to disagree mm. because it's a political house. But at least we take consolation in the fact that we have people who are representing us, people who are discussing issues of concern to us, such that we don't have to take the law into our own hands. Mm. We don't have to uh, um, have a conversation of about 28 million people. people. So I think that that is, that is uh, the essence of, uh, of the democracy that we have. And that, you know, Assuming we didn't have a parliament mm -hmm. and people have to argue and argue and argue, uh, the kind of chaotic situation that we would have had as a country. So sometimes we gloss over this, this important fact. Um, when you go out there, uh, you hear Ghana is a beacon of democracy and, and so on and so forth. I think it's only because of this unique symbol. Hmm. Uh, that 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 so, we so have. Parliament. Uh, uh, what you're saying is that Parliament has a big role to play in that sort of democratic credential that Ghana seems to enjoy in the eyes of a lot of. Uh, exactly, parties. just like you said in your introduction. I mean, whenever you have a military regime, you have the executive will continue to function, the judiciary will continue to function, but Parliament disappears. Hmm. So, if you talk about democracy and you taught yourself as a country that is democratic, the one big symbol is your deliberative assembly, and that's the parliament. Mm. I, 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 let, let's see if uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Alban Bagman can, can hear me now without the delays. Uh, sir, if you can hear me, this is Dr. Rashid Rahman's uh, perspective as to what is there to show it's more okay. than two decades of parliamentary democracy. What is your own observation of what is there to show? He can well, see. Well, I, I heard uh, Dr. Rashid Dramani, uh, who, as you know, is, is one of our experts and, in fact, a consultant. You cannot hear me? I hear you. Please go ahead. Over these years. And so what he, he says there is, is exactly the, the position of, of our democracy. But we have, we have gone far since 1993, uh, but there's still a long way to go. But so far as our continent is concerned, we are actually, truthfully, uh, a beacon of hope for Africa. And I believe with just a bit of efforts and focus, we could do better. Doing better. Actually, the question I was going to ask that when we say, well, when we seem to pamper ourselves to say that, well, this is what is, uh, there is to show, shouldn't we really be expecting more of 25 years of, of existence of a democratic parliament? Shouldn't the country expect more? Really, shouldn't we have more to show than what we see, what we're talking about now? Well, it's, it's normal to expect more, 
and uh, definitely is a prayer of everybody to get more than you actually achieve. And so um, I will not begrudge any Ghanaian for feeling so. But we should also forget that we are part of the global village. Uh, we, we belong to a continent that has uh, numerous challenges. Uh, we are a people with a unique history. And uh, you know where we came from after a very long uh, period of military regime. And therefore, habits, um, cultures, uh, attitudes uh, take time to change. And so it's not just the parliament, but it's the whole nation. And uh, I think we are all working at it. But I, I, I believe that if we are able to uh, rationalize a few things, we could do better than we are doing now. What are the things to be rationalized? In order not to have a general conversation, so we can limit it to a specific area of concern that we need to, and what needs to be, what needs to be done. Well, in 1990, yes, 19, 1992, the thinking and focus of the people was for us to move from the, the military regime to democratic governance. And therefore, there was not much focus on the type of option that we could adopt. And you recall that there was much disagreement as to whether we should adopt the parliamentary system or the presidential system. And if you have the opportunity to go through the committee of experts report as against the final outcome of the consultative assembly, which finally was also uh, tinkered with and finally voted for as the 1992 constitution, you will see the differences in thoughts of these institutions and bodies. And so we voted for the 1992 constitution just because we wanted to move away from the military regime to a constitutional democracy. Today, we're not thinking about that. We are now looking for good governance. You recall at the beginning, that is 1993, CDD was referred to as Center for Democratic Development. Today, CDD is referred to as Center for Democracy and Development. That, that is a clear evidence of the change of, of focus of Ghanaians. We're now trying to see how we can get the dividends of multi-party democracy to develop the country. And therefore, we're trying to look at the issue of quality now, the quality of democratic practice. Mm. So, what we need to do is really look at those original instruments. Because we are unlike the, the United Kingdom, where usually we say generally they don't have a written constitution. We have a written constitution, and we are practicing our democracy within the framework of that constitution. And so some of the challenges we are facing is as a result of the Constitution. And so with this development, we need to go back to the Constitution 
and see how we can improve upon some of the provisions to be able to go in tandem with the current reasoning and vision. And so that is a typical example of what we should do. The second is to look at the pillars of democracy. And what is, the, what is the, what I'm referring to? I'm referring to political parties. We're talking about multi-party democracy. What is the state of our parties? You know, is, is a party that transforms itself into a government. And so if the parties are in a very weak and powerless state, definitely your government will have challenges. And the quality of the democracy itself will be so affected. And so we will need to look at the state of the political parties in the country. Not okay. only how they are formed, but how they are funded, how they are managed, and how they link up to the government and influence governments in the country. It's very, very important. All right. So thank you very much, um, Mr. 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 Wagman, for that uh, submission. Let me engage you, uh, Dr. Draman, mm -hmm. on what he said so far. He's talking about an, a movement from uh, uh, an initial expectation of democracy itself mm -hmm. in, this, in this country. But one very key point he makes is about that is that it's about time we looked at the setup of political parties. Mm. How will that add to the quality that Parliament gives us? Well, um, maybe, yes, I'll talk about the political parties briefly, okay. but I would like to uh, um, perhaps maybe respond to some of the things that he has Very said. Well. Uh, in terms of the political parties, you know, um, as, as he said rightly, um, the current setup that we have in Parliament, almost all the members come from political parties. Mm -hmm. So by implication, if you have a political party... Did you say almost all the members? Is the, the, all the, all members the members come from yes. political parties. Yes, in fact, in the past we had some few independents. Okay. But today, but now, yes, I mean, almost yes. everybody is from a political party. Mm. So if you have um, a party that is not properly developed, that doesn't have systems and procedures, that's not democratic. Mm. In democratic theory, they say that the output that you are going to get is almost going to be the same, like the kind of um, quality that you these outputs pushing. are coming mm. from, uh, from. From So I think that that's the point that he's trying to make. Our parties are not quite developed. They don't follow the rules. Uh, they don't file their, their returns. returns. We don't know how they get their monies. And uh, of course, we don't have any funding public funding for political parties. So there are a lot of things that are happening there that we don't know. Uh, but if those exist, it will improve on the quality. Exactly. We get if from those Parliament. existed, um, not only would it improve maybe the, their internal processes and so on, what it will also do is that it will remove this huge burden that is on every parliamentarian. There's something that we call the legislative's dilemma. Hmm. When an MP goes into the house every day and he or she has to vote or has to take a decision at the committee level, he's confronted with the fact that am I representing myself? Am I representing country? Am I, am I representing, representing the, the people? Party? Am I representing the party? <laughs> That's the dilemma that they face every day. Right. And because most of them um, get supported by their political parties and sometimes we don't know where these resources come from. There are a lot of issues that we don't understand mm. a and lot they will of have to treasures that exactly come they have to decide quarters. in certain ways that you and i don't have mm. maybe may anyway. not necessarily be in our interest exactly right exactly so, so even I, though they're representing us even though the members of parliament are representing us technically they have right they have a lot of other um Stakeholders, for example, exactly. or they have a lot of other interests Interest. that they need to satisfy exactly. in their decision making. And then in, in our country, you want to add that to the constitutional provision where we have Minister MP. Mm. Minister MP. So in the morning, he's a member of parliament. In the afternoon, he's a minister of state. 
um, then that adds to the challenge. Okay. Um, okay. And then you have the president as the leader of the political party. That adds another layer of, of, of challenge. Mm. So I think that that's one thing about the political parties. But let me go back to um, whether there's anything to show. I think uh, for 25 years of parliamentary democracy, we have to break it down into maybe some of the core functional areas of parliament. Okay. They go there to make laws. Um, in the last 25 years, mm -hmm. I think in my opinion, they've only approved laws. We don't have private members' bills in this country. So if your member of parliament, um, I don't know where you come from, but maybe goes to your constituency and there's a problem and there's an issue that needs to be resolved, he can't come to parliament and say, I want to make a law that would cure this ill in my society. Almost all the laws that we've had in the last 25 years come from the executive. Even though constitutionally, I think there's nothing that stops our parliament from making laws. Mm. That's from maybe groups. I think what stops them is the sponsorship. And this is one of the issues that the current speaker has raised. Not, not as... necessarily the sponsorship. Not necessarily, MFR. And, and I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I want to see uh, a situation where maybe we can test this in the court. Parliament or members of parliament will come up, like Honorable Ayarga has said, he yes. wants to come up with a private right. members bill. I mean, let him come up with it and let's see who says that the constitution doesn't allow it or the standing order no, the doesn't allow it. The constitution allows, but if you have to push it through, yes. I guess it becomes very difficult along the line. That's why individuals like myself would not want to... Uh, no, to but members of parliament, and that is why, I mean, that's the point I'm coming down to. Okay. We should have had systems and processes in place by now, 25 years from the day when we started parliamentary democracy, for our parliament to be equipped okay. to the extent that if your MP or my MP wants to uh, initiate a private member's bill, just like it happens in other countries mm. on the continent, he or she has the necessary support. Okay. Uh, 25 years, I think, is, is quite a long time, and we don't have any excuse for that. Okay. So in terms of lawmaking, my point is that our parliament has approved so many laws. Like in the last uh, sitting, for instance, I think they approved more than, um, well, since the beginning uh, of uh, the seventh parliament, maybe more than 50 laws mm. have been approved and, I mean, uh, and passed. But all these laws have come, have emanated from the executive. From the executive. None of them has come from okay. a member of so parliament. So that's, you say, so that's that, law that you say is a major, it's a major failing it's, on it's, the 25 years exactly. of un uninterrupted democracy. Let's go back to Ms., um, Mr. Bagwin. I want to raise this issue so that we can uh, talk it to wrap up uh, the mm. conversation about gagging in, in parliament. One of the issues that the minority in parliament has recently raised is that they think that the speaker of parliament has been quite unfair to them and we just played the story uh, a report in, w in which we saw the back and forth the agitation that has characterized the sort of conversations that have arisen between the majority and the minority with the speaker playing the referee role and um, mr bagwin is that a different uh, phenomenon is that is this a new phenomenon from what you know before and how will it improve or jeopardize the work of parliament going forward Well, just before I, I comment on that one, let me say that uh, the fact that the Parliament of the Fourth Republic have not been able to uh, process private members' bill is, is not a, a failing. I, I, I think it's, it's a, a challenge that, as a country, we we'll have to work at. Um, we have, on a number of occasions, made an attempt to process private members' bills, but we have not succeeded because the interpretation of some provisions of the Constitution by the speakers and also by the executive arm uh, prevents us from doing that. 
I can recall the political parties act. Uh, we drafted one, uh, myself and the Honorable Dr. Apraku, and we were told that that had financial implications and therefore it could not be tabled in the house by a private member. I recall my efforts supported by Dr. Rashid Ramani and in fact funded by, by his uh, uh, parliamentary center. Uh, we finished drafting a bill to establish the Budget Act, uh, the Budget Office, uh, but again, the executive thought that this had financial implications and could not be done by a private member. And so it's, it's, it's an issue that we all have to look at. It's not a failing of the Parliament of Ghana. But coming back to the, the pre presiding role of a speaker, a speaker, even though the, the term is uh, speaker, is not to speak. He is called a speaker because he speaks for and on behalf of the legislature. But when he is performing the role of a presiding officer, by the rules of engagement, the speaker is not to participate in the debates. He doesn't descend into the arena of conflict. The speaker is to act as an impartial empire, not a neutral empire. There is no neutrality in this matter, but as an impartial empire. Now, in performing that role, because the minority is already in a weaker position, the fact that they are in a weaker position means if it comes to an issue of voting, uh, by virtue of practice, and particularly in the parliamentary system, the whip will be applied, and the majority members always vote in bulk. So the minority always loses when it comes to an issue of voting. But the majority is giving ample space to have a say, to be able to contribute. And these contributions could help the majority in government to improve upon whatever proposals was tabled before the House. And so it is one of the responsibilities of a speaker to protect the minority against the bullying of the majority. Is, is that what and you so see? Do we see that happening in Parliament now? Because the minority uh, have been complaining. Part of the majority, the minority has every right. Yes, yes, they have been complaining. And I myself have raised some issues about it, not on the floor, but outside the floor. It's, it's important that our speaker adopts the posture of the late Justice D.F. Anang, who, as everybody will recall, acted as the father of the house. Are, are you saying by what, you're, what you just space. mentioned, that, Sometimes that the speaker, that the current speaker, that, that the current speaker has not to put across really given the minority a fair hearing? Mind. I can say that with all the confidence and authority at my disposal, I have experienced so many speakers from 1993 up to date. I have participated in some proceedings and sat in so many parliaments all over the world and have seen that parliaments that call themselves democratic parliaments do everything to protect the minority and give them more space to have a say. And then at the end of the day, 
the majority will have their way because they will vote and win. In fact, there was one debate we participated in when I was minority leader, and that had to do with this uh, International Criminal Court. And I recall that the, the then ambassador uh, of America to Ghana did say that, yes, you, the minority, won the debate, but you lost the vote. So are you, what, what I so want you to, briefly, because of our, our time constraints, I'd like for you to address whether or not almost always this speaker is fair from your perspective. He is not. I have stated that already. I have stated that already, that he is not fair in his, in his handling of okay. his role as a presiding officer. Okay, let me take Mr. Drama, uh, Dr. Draman's response to this, and then we'll wrap up uh, with your very final comment, Mr. Bagwin. Uh, uh, Mr. Draman, now, here's a uh, very experienced parliamentarian who has been in parliament for all, this, uh, all these years saying that the current speaker is not protecting the minority enough. What do you envisage can be done to move this uh, conversation forward? Because even now, w once it is established that they are not being protected, they still have to have a conversation. Mm. They still have to mm. debate going mm. forward. Mm. How do they do that, irrespective of what has happened in the past and how they think the speaker is unfair? Well, I think uh, they have an internal mechanism for resolving uh, their conflicts and differences. And I sincerely think that dialogue is what is going to uh, resolve these differences that we see be between the speaker and the minority. But who should start that dialogue? Um, I think, for me, I believe the majority leader uh, and some of the leaders from the majority side have a responsibility, mainly because of one thing. At the end of the sixth parliament, when the majority leader was on his feet, I mean, giving an account of the stewardship of uh, Right Honorable Doa Jaho, mm. uh, I think some of the West were not very kind. And I don't want to see the same thing uh, happen, particularly because they had cause to complain mm. in the sixth parliament. Um, like Honorable Babin said, the speaker, every speaker of parliament, is a product of the party that has the majority in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, his primary responsibility is to ensure that the perception that the minority comes to the house with, that you know, it's, uh, the speaker is going to be uh, maybe more tilted towards the interests of the majority, that perception should be the number one thing that guides everything that a speaker of parliament does um, whenever he steps into the chamber. So that's why this speaker has a responsibility to make sure that the interest of the minority is protected. Because at the end of the day, if it has to come to a vote, mm -hmm. uh, the majority is going to have its way. So I don't see what the fears are and what the on issues... The, on the part of the speaker. On the part of, of the speaker. Of allowing the minorities exactly. to just speak their mind. And but do you see, do you share in that sense with um, Honorable Bagwin that the, the speaker is unfair? Well, uh, I am not in the House, so I'm not able to make that pronouncement. But, but based on what see, I see, exactly. based on what I see, all I can say is that it's not good for our democracy to see a minority every day on a path of confrontation with the Speaker of Parliament. Okay. And to even hear the minority leader say, if you give me the opportunity, I will, I will disrespect, disrespect you. you. That is not good. Look, before the Speaker was, uh, was, was uh, given that role, we had an opportunity, even on this your platform, to speak about some of the qualities that we were looking for in the yeah. next Speaker of our Parliament. I and remember that very yes, well. Yes, and one of them, one of the things that I said was that we wanted somebody who, um, would be very, very impartial. We wanted somebody who would have an eye on legacy. Okay. And I was very pleased when uh, we had somebody of the stature of uh, the right Professor honorable speaker. I mean, given that uh, he has done everything, and now maybe all he's looking for is legacy. Mm -hmm. And you don't want these little conflicts to blight 
I mean, the legacy that you have record. left. Right. Okay. Yes. Well, let's end this conversation. Mm. Let, let me take a very quick final comment. Uh, uh, please make it brief for me, um, Honorable Member of Parliament for Nadoli Kaleo. Um, going forward, it's 25 years. You have been through the, throughout the system. Going forward, what should Ghanaians expect from this parliament? Well, it's the decision of, of Ghanaians as to whether they want a strong parliament uh, that can stand the might of, of the executive, or they want a weak parliament that will continue to be in the belly of the executive. That is a decision for Ghanaians to take. If the Ghanaians want to get an improvement on what we have already, there are a number of things that have to be done, even if we are not able to uh, review the provisions of the Constitution. We will need to uh, understand and appreciate the institution that we have created and proceed to support it. Okay. And how do you do that? You do that by providing with the necessary necessary logistics and finance to be able to function. Okay. When I talk about necessary logistics and finance, it doesn't all lie in the authority of parliament. Most of it lies in the bosom of the executive. A member of parliament is not has to be supported by technical people to be able to do his work not only on the floor of parliament, but also in his or her constitu uh, the constituency. That is not what we have in Ghana. Even during the time of Dr. President Lehman, uh, a member of parliament had a secretary paid for by the state. Today, no member of parliament has a secretary paid for by the state. A member of parliament during Dr. Lehman's time had a driver paid for by the state. Today, that is not a situation. Members of parliament are given some allowance okay. to try to pay for recruit drivers by themselves. And that is so small okay. that if you don't have additional finance, you will not be able to get any quality driver. Th thank you very and much. Uh, th thank you very much, sir, for your time this afternoon. Uh, the Member of Parliament for Nadoli Kaleo, Alban Bagwin, who has also been in Parliament uh, since its inception, very long time, over two, over two decades there, bringing us uh, his perspective on how Ghanaians can make the most of Parliament. Dr. Draman is still here. Dr. Draman, let me take your very final submission mm. on how Ghana can benefit from its Parliament. We're spending so much money on them anyway. How can we benefit from them going forward without the confrontations without the misunderstandings or the mi disagreements, etc. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much. This discussion would need a bit, a bit, a little bit of uh, time. Unfortunately, we don't have I agree. time, so I agree. that will be for another day. But I think, look, we have to look at the, I mean, one of the core functions of parliament is the, 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 the I mean, the, the function of oversight. I think as it stands now, our parliament has fallen woefully inadequate when it comes to exercising its oversight functions because that is where you and I get mm. the benefits. Our budgets get voted by parliament. Parliament is supposed to police these budgetary allocations and provisions mm. to make sure that you and I get health care, you and I get education and so on. Anybody who flouts the wish of parliament is made to face the rigors of the law. Mm. Year in, year out, you hear the Auditor General. That is just uh, an indication for you about uh, how, you know, the, the function of ensuring that the power of the press is exercised by a group of people right. has not really worked perfectly. Mm. Um, 
True, Honorable Bagwin has talked about all the challenges. But I think, yes, partly some of them are constitutional, legal. But I think I will place a huge burden on the members of parliament themselves, themselves. and on the leaders of parliament. True. Finally, I think um, one other area where you and I can benefit um, from our parliament and from our parliamentary democracy is the area of representation. Hmm. Um, as it stands now, most of our MPs, like you said, even in parliament, they only recently got offices. In the constituency, when you want to meet them, you have to go to their house and so on. And if you don't have a relationship with, with them, them, you can't access. Uh, they use their own monies uh, to buy vehicles to conduct um, affairs of parliament, which I think, personally, I think that is, that is, not, uh, that is not quite fair to them. But I think in order for um, Ghanaians to be on their side, uh, I think certain things would also need to change in Parliament. Okay. You show almost all the time um, pictures in Parliament when proceedings are supposed to start and then you see None a house of them. that uh, uh, is uh, half, empty. half empty. <laughs> so people are saying, why are we paying uh, these 275 members? They don't show up for work. All right. And then if you add the fact that we have to give them vehicles, we have to give them secretaries and so on, Many people are going to argue that, I mean, what are we really getting from this? That's true. So I think there are so many um, issues to look at. Okay. But I think overall, um, we've had a very good start. But 25 years is such a long time to still remain a toddler. And our <laughs> parliament is still a toddler. Our parliament is still a toddler. That's a very interesting way to end mm. your submission, Dr. Draman. Thank you very much for coming. Mm. Dr. Rashid Draman is the executive director of the African Center for Parliamentary Affairs. We're also joined from Parliament Live by the member of parliament for Nadoli Kalu, Alban Bagbin. He's been in parliament for over two decades. Of course, you know him.